God, we want to thank you today for being our everything. Hallelujah. You said to Moses on the back side of the desert, when they shall ask my name, tell them I am. And we found you, Lord, to be everything. When we were sinners, you are salvation. Hallelujah. Sick, you became our doctor. In trouble, you became our advocate, our attorney. And in a lonely hour, you became our friend. Thank you that you are our everything. So now, Lord, if you would just anoint these lips of clay, allow us to speak as an oracle of Christ. Hide us behind your glorious cross and cover us with your precious blood that no flesh would glory in your sight. And whatever you do, we take no credit, but we give you all the glory and all of the honor through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise and you may be seated. Uh, let me say just before getting into uh, the message today, I'm going to do something I don't think I've done more than once or twice in the whole 30 years. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we're going to cancel church tonight. Won't be no church tonight. Uh, you know, I don't cancel services, but after we clear the building from whatever's going on, we're going we're gonna to lock it down. In Israel, God even demanded that the uh, land had a rest. We're going to give the steps and the elevators and the lights a rest. Uh, tomorrow night at bedtime will be the beginning of our time of fasting. Because of the celebration, we did not observe our first of the month fast on this past Tuesday. But we'll do that on this Tuesday. And I look forward to, uh, after you get this good rest, because I know most of y'all don't come to church no way, but we'll just pretend as though you normally come on Sunday night and we're gonna rest up until time for church uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, happy for Dr. Claudia Hamilton, the sister of our mother Diola. Amen, and we're happy for Mother Theta Wells being present on today, and um, all of the saints of God who are present. I don't want you to forget now, next Sunday at 11 o'clock, another special message designed for our young people uh, in that I'm going to talk about uh, gangs. I so said, what did he know about gangs? Well, I'll tell you when you get here Sunday, but... Uh, there are there are gangs in the Bible some good some bad I want to talk about uh, gangs in the scripture and I believe that God will use it to bless many of our young people because that certainly is one of the uh, great problems faced on today then the next Sunday which is the third Sunday in the month of March is Palm Sunday that's going to be a great day of victory crusade. What is it? What is it that you are battling with and you need victory over it? Uh, third Sunday at 11 o'clock. Palm Sunday will be day of victory. And victory means that the war has been going on. Uh, but the enemy is defeated and you have come out the victor. Hello, somebody. And then on the fourth Sunday, three weeks from the day, that's the day when even folk who don't go to church go to church. Resurrection Sunday. Amen. The Lord gave me this particular rundown for the month of March. And I know that anything that he gives, it always proves to be a blessing to the corporate body and to the individual membership. Now let me um, 
call your attention again. We read it. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning of the chapter this time, but we're going back to Genesis 26. There, there was so much. And that chapter that looked like you can never absorb it totally. Genesis 26, and this time we're going to um, begin reading with verse 17, verse 17 through 22. If you have it, say amen. amen. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerah and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerod did strive with Isaac's herdmen saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, for now, the Lord hath made room for us. And we shall be fruitful in the land. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers and hearers of his word. God bless you, ushers. Today we praise God for 30 years that he has allowed this congregation to be in existence. 30 years of salvation, healing, deliverance, victory and prosperity for this corporate body as well as for the individual families and persons who comprise this ministry. As I said this morning at the communion service, really when you look at the program that was made available today. Uh, I spoke with uh, Sister Rhonda Parks who uh, is in charge of our publications and I told her just this past Monday, I said, Rhonda, I want a, a cover for our program this coming Sunday that incorporates the movements. I want the old building where we moved and uh, started from rather and then uh, the larger part of the white and gold and then uh, I want the building that we're in now the worship center and uh, the family life but that only talks of 30 years uh, in terms of brick and mortar that talks about physical structures but if you really want to know the story of the 30 years and the spiritual movement that was taking place, uh, there could be volumes of books written. I know most of you were kind of lost today when uh, it was time for the statement of faith and you picked up your program and saw the synopsis of what we believe. Uh, I moved away from the standard uh, Church of God in Christ statement of faith and went back to that which the Lord gave me 30 years ago uh, because of the criticism that we encountered at the beginning when the prophets of doom predicted that we wouldn't last six months. And they branded us as a non-Christian cult espousing false doctrines because we were not at that time identified with a major denomination. Uh, they talked about us and I said, well, Lord, 
you, you gotta you gotta help me and I, I'm not a, a writer I don't consider myself a writer said, but you've got to allow me to articulate what we believe and in one week I sat down and began to write the synopsis of what we believe what do we believe about God what do we believe about scripture what do we believe about man and uh, I really think that uh, the synopsis that he gave me uh, that we used in the earlier years, uh, I think that doctrinally that speaking, it's superior to the one that we quote every Sunday. Uh, actually, ours was born in the heat of persecution. And I don't care what you say, when God uh, sees that you are under fire, A lot of folk, their, their salvation, their religion, if you please. Uh, it's not about much because it hasn't been tested. Uh, it's got to be tried in the fire before you really know whether it is pure gold. Well, in spite of all the criticisms and an attempt on my life, and some of y'all were around and others were not. But on that... Uh, Friday afternoon, we started from March 2nd, Sunday, March 2nd, with the opening, and I started a noonday prayer every day, 12 noon, and I personally led it myself every day through March and through April and May. I'm coming out of the church that Friday evening in June. I had gone down into the office, and everybody else had cleared the building, Got into the car, the old building that we bought from Mount Vernon Baptist. Put the car in reverse and I looked and I saw a familiar figure. And I said, what is he doing with that BB gun? And something said, that's not a BB gun, that's a rifle. And looking through a telescopic lens, the young man shot I'm trying to remember that they say 16 bullets looking through the scope and looking at me and yet God fanned those bullets and they went over the head over the roof of the car and hit the meat market next door and people wondered what, what is that all about and uh, you know how folk are you know, had preacher been doing something, he don't have no business. I guess that man wouldn't have done that. And nobody believed that he was, well, I won't say nobody, but most people did not believe that the young man was demented. Even that Sunday morning when I walked in church and I expected the saints to rejoice because that pastor's life had been spared. And when I walked in, there was no rejoicing. and everybody was looking at me as if to say, now what you going to say? <laughs> Quiet. And it was eight years later when the same young man killed his mother and cut her body up and put it in a garbage can and rolled it down the street and dumped it. It wasn't until then that people said, you know, Apostle Patterson said that there was something wrong with him. But when you have been through it, some, some, some people don't understand why the foundation of this ministry is so strong. Let me tell you that if you are building a house that's going to last, you're going to have to go deep enough to build a solid, on a solid foundation. But when you build on a solid foundation, let the winds blow. Let the lightning flash. Let the thunder roll and let the earth quake. When it's all over, you'll still be standing. I do not say these things to glorify Gilbert Patterson because I did not bring this to pass. Today I join with the psalmist in proclaiming in Psalm 118 and 23, this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. 
Somebody ought to praise God right about that. Our anniversary this year is very special in that we're celebrating 30 years. 30 years has uh, biblical significance. The number 30 has biblical significance. First of all, 30 is the number of maturity. The sons of Levi, namely Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. Their sons had to be 30 years old before they could serve as Levites in the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but you can make a note and read Numbers chapter 4. Um, Jesus himself did not begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. You can read that in Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that he who is the son of God that was born of the Virgin Mary and God protected him as an infant by speaking to Joseph to carry the child and his mother down into Egypt. The same Jesus that at 12 years old, even at eight days old at the temple, the spirit of prophecy fell on Simeon and Anna. And they had to recognize that this is the seed that God had promised, the salvation of God for mankind. And the same Jesus that at 12 years old had such a zeal for the house of God that when the family were on their way back to Nazareth, he wouldn't leave the temple. But it was not until he was 30 years old that he came to be baptized and 40 days in the wilderness. And after those 40 days and successfully passing every test, it was then that the miracles began. You would think that Jesus, as special as he was, and some people read those lost books and you see him as a little boy working miracles, but the Bible doesn't bear that out. Uh, he was not a miracle worker until the time of his maturity. You know, I'm persuaded to believe that out of all that God has done here at Temple of Deliverance in these 30 years, that he hasn't done anything but laid the foundation where now the miracles are about to begin. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm talking about the miracles of broken families being reunited. The climate is right. Oh yeah, things are happening in this global economy. Uh, crime has reached its zenith. And somehow God has planted us and brought us to full maturity. Uh, we haven't been doing anything. If you think that God has blessed in this ministry, I just wish you'd touch somebody and tell them you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. 30 is the number of maturity. Joseph was 30 years old when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and became ruler over Egypt. You can check that out in Genesis 41 and 46. If I'm going too fast for you, you know what to do. That's right, get the tape. 30 is also the number of mourning. Israel mourned for Aaron at his death 30 days. That's in Numbers 20 and 29. They mourned for Moses 30 days. Deuteronomy 34 and 8. So what I don't understand is if God did not permit them as great a leader as Moses was to mourn but 30 days, he didn't permit them to mourn but 30 days at the death of Aaron. Why is it that people of God allow a spirit of grief and depression to set in and that loved one that you lost six months ago and you still crying last year and you're still crying. Satan has a way of getting God's folk into a state of depression. But there comes a time when it does not matter what has happened in your life. You've got to wipe your tears. And then you've got to move on. And realize that you might have been in a difficult situation. But it ain't over. Hallelujah. I don't care what the devil has done to you. You've got to realize morning time is over. And now it's time to get up and move by the presence of God 
Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. God, God bless our congressman, Harold Ford Jr. So happy to see him. He also is a great part of this. Opening day, March 2nd, 1975, when his mother uh, joined the church and he was just a little tot. He and his little brother, they were right there, oh yeah. <laughs> the church has a glorious history and we thank God for seeing him on today. So morning time ends at the number 30. 30 days. Somebody's probably getting angry with me about that, but uh, I'm trying to tell you that God does not want, I don't care how much you love the person and how dear they were, he does not want you to get stuck with a spirit of depression. That's why God appointed them a time to mourn. Now, as I said, 30 is the number of maturity, and 30 uh, it was a time of mourning. It was the number of mourning. But 30 is also uh, the number of the blood of Christ. Will you touch somebody and tell them 30 is the number of the blood of Christ? What are you talking about, preacher? Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You read it in Matthew 26, verses 14 and 15. And then in Matthew 27 and 6, it ends with the phrase that it is the price of blood. Judas had sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And then when he realized what he had done, he went and tried to give the money back. But they said, we can't put it in the treasury because it is the price of blood. Now, if 30 represents the blood of Jesus, oh, you don't see where I am now. That means the time is now right to get your family under the blood. Hallelujah. You've been trying to get them to come to church with you. You've been trying your best to get them saved. But hallelujah, this is the year the year that designates the blood of Jesus. And it's time now to get Susie and Sally. It's time to get John Henry. It's time to get everybody. Time to get the little one that's standing on the corner selling dope. It's time to get that one that's disobedient and hard-headed. You ought to just tell three people, I don't know what you're gonna do, but I'm gonna get my family under the blood. Because the time is right. Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Well, 30 years. And I would say that most people would believe that in 30 years, this ministry has become uh, somewhat successful. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I think at this point you will agree uh, that I do know a little something. Uh, I told you I wanted to discuss with you just a little bit about principles of success that will cause your ministry. And that doesn't mean necessarily preachers and pastors, but everybody, I believe, has a God-given ministry. And I would tell you that the first point in making your ministry a success is to know what is your calling and determine to stay with it. Know your calling and determine to stay with it. Well, I preach, where are you getting that from? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 20 says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. You got too many people, that, they're busy looking at what somebody else is doing and, and thinking about what a great success this individual is. But you got to look and see. Uh, don't try to be somebody else and don't try to do what they do and you don't know whether their calling and your calling are the same. You've got to know what your 
calling is. Thought about the story Dr. King told about the man during the civil rights era that was always wanting to make sure that, uh, you know, people were discriminating against him. And he said, you know, you need to look into such and such an institution. They prejudiced the down there. See, they, they won't, won't, won't hire me be, 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 because I'm b -b 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 black. So, what, what are you applying for? I, I, I won't want to be, be, be a radio announcer. A whole sentence. Maybe radio announcing is not what you're called to. I mean, why try to be chief chef when only one day out of 22 can you prepare toast without burning it? No, you're calling. You'd be surprised to know how far just that one point will get you, knowing you're calling. Paul writing to the uh, church at Colossae, uh, he says to the leader of the church, uh, I want you to do this one thing in, in the chapter 4 and verse 17. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. In other words, Archippus was messing up the church, trying to do what he wasn't called to do. Second Timothy 4 and 5. Here again, Paul says, to Timothy, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Why is that? Because Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether well, prophecy, let us prophesy according to to the portion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, do it with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever your particular gift is, know it and then exercise the gift that God has given you. Ask somebody, do you know what your gift is? Now put your hand on your own chest and ask yourself. <laughs> everybody isn't called to preach the gospel. And everybody who's called to preach the gospel isn't called the pastor. My dad, when I was just a little boy, he, he really would say some things that uh, were comical, but he was right on target. And he said that uh, you have to learn, as the scripture says, that God gives gifts and talents to different individuals on a different level. He said there are some people that God has given the authority in a pastoral role to lead tenfold. Some a hundred, some a thousand. Jesus, when he talked about the parable of the talents, he talked about one was given one talent, one, two, and another five. The five talent man, he was so gifted 
that he went out and increased it and came back with ten talents. The man with two increased it to four. The one with one talent wrapped it in a napkin, dug a hole in the earth, and didn't do nothing with it. And you got a whole lot of folk, the little bit God has given them, they are angry because he didn't give them more, and they're bearing the little bit God has given them. And he said, there are some men that cannot pastor a thousand members. And don't give them a church with a hundred or two hundred. Because if that talent dictates that they can lead ten folk, you can rest assured that they're going to keep on beating up on the folk until they get the number back down to ten. If he can't handle... <laughs> If he can't handle but 10, you may as well not give him but 10. That's as far as he's going. I can remember the youngster coming up when it looked like, uh, especially in our community, preachers had fighting spirits. Always beating up on folk. Someone said to me yesterday, so Bishop, I have never seen anything like this. We're going over here to a building the building is paid for uh, over four million, closer to five million dollars, and the people are still happy. And they said that I'm used to people when, when you're in a building drive getting angry and upset. But see, you have to learn. One day I had to learn the difference between trying to pastor a small church and a mega church. You know. And the thing about it is one thing I know you can't take a mega church and beat up on folk all the time In fact truth of the matter. I don't beat up on folk no time I determine not only for your good, but for my own health I don't let folk upset me no more. I Quit letting folk upset me long time ago If you want to come to church act a fool and don't want to live according to what God's word say. I'm going to open the Bible. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to teach it. But I'm not going to be a policeman to try to follow you to see whether you live it. If you want to know what it takes to be prosperous, I'm going to go into God's word. I'm going to tell you about tithing. That when you tithe, you partner up with the Lord. And, and I know when I was in school, they told me that, well, these three basic uh, kinds of uh, businesses, the single proprietorship, the, the partnership, and the corporation. And the thing about it is a single proprietorship usually fails because of lack of capital. In the partnership, each partner is liable for the debt of the other which means that if that's your partner, they can make a debt and then you end up getting sued. In the corporation, limited liability because the corporation becomes a person that can sue or be sued. So you can protect your personal asset. But when I found out about the business of living, I'll agree, single proprietorship won't work because none of us on our own have what is sufficient to live this life. You can't live your life as a corporation because you are responsible for your deeds. And what society says is the most dangerous, a partnership is the only way to live your spiritual life. But God has to be the senior partner. And the way you show that he's the senior partner is you pay your partnership dues. Every time you get a hold of something, you tell him, here's your 10%. And you make him the senior partner in the business of your life. And then the things you are liable for, since the partner is responsible for the debts of the other, I'll tell the Lord, Lord, I've been doing it your way, so this is your responsibility. You got to get me out of this. I can't handle it by myself. But if I get through preaching that and teaching that, and you decide all you want to do is come to church and ball up, a dollar bill stick it in the envelope make the envelope puff out like it's got something in it I ain't gonna fuss about it you just cheated yourself out of being prosperous oh you don't hear what I'm saying everybody isn't called to preach the gospel and then everybody who's called to preach isn't called a pastor 
and then every pastor isn't meant to be on television. There's some churches I thought about visiting until I saw them on TV. <laughs> There's some preachers I thought was doing pretty good until I heard them on the radio. Everybody is not that gift to be in the media. And then even if it is your gift, you got to know how to do it. At times I've gone places and people, Bishop Patterson, how do you do it? I tell you, I listen Sunday after Sunday. And every time I hear it, 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 it's a home run. Every time I hear it, it's a great message. How, how can anybody get up and preach all the time and always be on target? I said, because the days I'm not on target, I tell them, don't you dare put that on TV. <laughs> Some sermons, when I get through preaching, I'll tell them, to take this, don't duplicate it, hide it. Put it somewhere where you can't even find it. <laughs> let, let, me, let me move on here. There's no substitute for knowing your calling. And once you know your calling, it's dangerous to not abide in it. There's an interesting example of this fact found in 1 Kings chapter 13. Uh, there was a young prophet that the Lord gives him a message. And he sends him and tells him to go to this city and don't, don't salute nobody by the way. Make the prophecy and go home. Don't go to dinner with nobody. Just, just do what I tell you. And out of all of the men that you read about in the Bible who had encounters with lions, there was Samson who encountered a lion on the road to Timnath and he killed him with his bare hand. Hallelujah. There was David getting ready to fight Goliath and he told Saul, he said, let me give you some of my worn experience. I've been attacked by a lion and by a bear and God gave me the power to kill the lion and to kill the bear. And then there was Daniel who was in a den of lions. Hallelujah. And the lions couldn't eat him. But this prophet, God sent him on a task and told him what to do. He knew what his mission was. He went and he did what God told him to do and started back home. Young men tried to get him to, to go home and eat with him. No, 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 uh-uh. And so the old prophet. The Bible doesn't say he was backslidden, but we get that impression. See, when you know what your calling is, you got to be mighty careful about people who will redirect the message that God has given you. The old prophet wondered which, which way to go. They told him, I'll tell you what, go and find him and let him know who you are. Let him know that, that you are the son of, of the old prophet and I'm uh, you know, I'm a prophet like him, so tell him to, it's all right. God said it's all right. Come on back and eat with me. And he put his feet under that man's table and ate. And when he finished his meal, the old prophet said, now don't you know what God told you? He told you don't go home to dinner with nobody. He told you don't salute nobody on the way. He said, so now you're not going to make it to your homeland. And on the way back, he was attacked by a lion and was killed. He knew what his calling was, but he didn't have the courage to walk in it. I'm here to tell you that whenever God puts a calling on your life, whatever it is, do not think for a moment that there will not be distractions. Satan is the master of distractions. He'll try to turn you aside from what God has said to you. And if you don't know your calling, you will be easily dissuaded. But when you know, everybody's not going to pat you on the back. 
some folk would rather kick you on the lower portion of your back. They are not going to encourage you. But when you know that this is what God has said, honey, I'm sorry you may not understand. But I got to do this thing the way God told me to do it. Let, 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 me, let me move on. You got to know your calling and you got to abide in it. And then you've got to also, uh, how do I say this? You'll need a role model to follow. Well, preacher, how does all of this tie in? When you read this entire 26th chapter, from the very top, I just started reading it from verse 17, but when you read it from verse 1 in 26th chapter of Genesis, you will see very quickly that Isaac followed the role model of his father, Abraham. The first verse talks about there was a famine in the land, but it quickly says not the, like the first famine, not the first famine that was in Abraham's day. In other words, some of the same things that Abraham went through, Isaac had to go through the same thing. You're living in a day now when there are so many ministries that's telling you that you don't have to do anything but look into the Bible and find those positive scriptures and get up every morning and confess the word and stand on the word. Now the people who basically started that positive confession movement, most of the pioneers of that, they're dead. When they started, they had gone into the sixth chapter of Genesis and they were confessing that they were going to live to get 120. So y'all don't even know that. But now they confess that there would be no sickness. But all of that group that started this thing about 40 years ago, just about all of them have had severe sickness. Many of them are dead. And now they're finding out that while they had people trying to walk on the cloud, they should have done it the other way. Keep your feet on the ground, lift your head to the cloud, but don't try to walk on the cloud. You have to have role models that you can talk to during the time of difficulty. Isaac had the role model of his father Abraham because in Abraham's time, and it's in the 12th chapter, I will ask you to mention that, 12th chapter, where God spoke to Abraham and told him what he was going to do in his life. I'm going to bless you, make you a blessing, make your name great. Hallelujah. I'm going to bless him that bless you, curse him that curse you. In thee and in thy seed, all family of the earth are going to be blessed. God, God got through saying all of that. And the next thing you know, famine hit. And Abraham had to go down into Egypt. Sometimes God will give you a prophecy concerning your life and you'll feel so caught up and happy and the next thing you know look like the bottom fell out and the ceiling fell in on you. But when you know what God has said, then you can go through the difficulty. Abraham went down into Egypt and, and what does he do? Pharaoh looks upon his wife, very beautiful woman. The Bible says, Father, look upon, talking about Sarah. And Pharaoh wanted that woman, so looked at Abraham, who is she? Oh, this is my sister. He told a half-truth. It wasn't a whole lie, just a half-truth. Because she was his half-sister. Later on, Isaac is faced with famine. He also has a beautiful wife named Rebecca. King of Jirah wanted her. So who is she? So oh, she's my sister. Here he is also. He's followed his father with a beautiful woman. 
He follows his father telling the same lie. Not complimenting lies, not, you know, but had it not been that Abraham was in a tight and knew how to get out of it, Isaac wouldn't have had an example. Somebody who's been in tight places who have the same calling as you, you got to have them as a role model, as a resource person. You got to have somebody as a resource person. I don't let nobody talk to me but God. He talks to me in my dreams. Baby, you'd be surprised how the devil can crash your dreams. Sometimes you got to look at somebody who's got their feet planted safely on the ground. And the Bible says, what, know them that do what? Labor among you. You know who we usually pick? We pick somebody that we see on television and don't know. Honey, ooh, I tell you, I want to be like so-and-so-and-so. And -so. And if you go to that city and stay there two weeks, you'd find out you really don't want. Because what you see on TV and what you hear on the radio is not the person that you think. That's why God tells you to know them that labor among you. You got to know somebody who is close to you you got to see how they deal with getting sick. You got to see how they deal with people lying on them. You got to see how they deal when it looked like everything has gone against them. Do they still hold on to faith? Uh, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He had a role model by the name of Abraham. Abraham was also an example of patience. If you're going to succeed, you're going to have to have some patience. You can call it whatever you want to, but here God told the man, walk before me and I'm going to bless you and in you and in your seed. All families of earth will be blessed. And then here he is, 75 already. My God. And here his wife is 65. And God said, I'm going to bless and the whole earth is going to be blessed through your seed. And you would think if God made a promise like this to a man like Abraham, God's going to get started real quick. But 11 years later, 11 years later, have nothing happened. Man, 86 years old. Sarah, 76. And God haven't done a thing. So they decided to help God out. All right, Abraham, go, go head on in the Hagar. I see, I've been seeing a cutting eyes at you now. Go on, go on, and, go on to Hagar. Hagar conceived and bore a son named Ishmael. And God said concerning Ishmael, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Um, this isn't the promised seed, but I'm going to bless him because he's yours. Uh, watch him, he's going to be wild. Every man's going to be against him. He's going to be against every man. I'm going to bless and 12 princes will come from him and he'll dwell among his brothers. He was talking about the all rich Arab nations. And you look on the map now in the Middle East and all of them are dwelling right there together. And the only insertion in there is Israel. Bless because they're seed of Abraham. But God still said, now the one that I'm going to make my covenant with is going to be born to Sarah. And the Lord didn't say another word from 86 until 99. 13 years later, and the angel of the Lord stepped in before Abraham and said, uh, the promise that I made to you, you remember what I said, I'm going to bless all families of earth through you. And I never could understand what Paul meant when he said Abraham staggered not. He didn't stagger. He fell down. <laughs> fell in the dust. Laughing. And God did not rebuke him for some reason. While he was laughing. But when Sarah heard it in her tent door. She started to laugh. And the angel got stern. And ask Abraham, what is Sarah doing laughing? Uh, I didn't laugh. Say, so you did laugh. But I want you to know I'm going to do, according to the time of life, exactly what I said. They didn't understand it. But you got to understand this one thing about God. If he makes a promise, you're going to have to have patience to wait on it. 
You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. But if God promised it, he will bring it to pass. So it was that it was a year after that. The angel of the Lord said, when the baby comes, just name him ha ha ha. I want you to always be reminded every time you look at him, his name means laughter. And every time you look at him, I want you to remember that you laughed in the face of God. But that baby, ha ha ha, Isaac, grew up following the example of his father Abraham. And when he went to Gerah and went through the famine, hallelujah, and the men of Gerah got jealous of him. They could look at him and tell there was something special about him. I want you to know that when you are a believer in God, folk can look at you and they recognize you got a look on you that's different from the people of the world. One of the worst problems that we have as people of God is always trying to prove to the world the folk that I'm not different. When we came up as children in the sanctified church, we always wanted the other children to think we are not different. They would laugh at us as some sanctified children. <laughs> yeah, their parents go to the sanctified church. In fact, his dad is the sanctified preacher. It was a big joke, and we always wanted to do something, dress in a certain way, say something, act up, do something to prove that we are not different. And the enemy always wants you to do something to make the world think that I'm just like you. Here we are today. We smile on things that God curse. Things that God said you shouldn't do. And we're trying to, I don't see why they hop on that either. And you ought to be standing up for what God's word has to say. But always trying to prove to the world that I'm not different. Let me tell you, you are different. You deny and delay your blessing when you try to not be different. Hallelujah. Those men of G-Rock could look at Isaac. And they knew when they looked at him. Say, hey, you, you got something we don't have. They told him, get away from us, depart from us, because you are greater than us. Why? He was traveling with a suitcase and a promise. He had a promise that the same God that blessed your daddy is going to bless you. I want you to know that, that if you're going to succeed in what God has assigned to your hand, you may not have it in your hand now. But as a child of God, you are traveling with a suitcase and a promise. You may be a sojourner now, but you got a promise. God said, I'm going to make you. He was great. The Bible, if you read it up from the top of the chapter, you'll see he was already great. But after a while, the Bible said he became very great. I don't care how God is blessing you now. He can still bless you until you can become greater than you are right now. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and tell them, child of God, you got another blessing on the way. Mm. You haven't stopped shouting over the one last month, but I want you to know he got another one on the way. And I just feel it in my spirit right now that God's got another. Hallelujah. I think you need to tell about five people around you. Look for it. God's got another blessing and is heading your way. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Uh, listen, listen, listen. I, I, I'm going to go on and get through with this. A little bit later starting, and I, and I know y'all watching your watches now. But, but, but after a while, after God got through blessing Isaac, and the men of Gerah put him out from them. Yeah, we don't want you around. I just want to tell you, don't become insulted nor intimidated when Satan's folk don't want to be around you. You got to learn how to buck intimidation. If they don't want you around them, don't worry about it. The reason they don't want you is because they see something that maybe you don't see in yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. You ever seen any of those old uh, crazy movies they have on where they, 
they're talking about the zombies and werewolves and and they talk about that that image won't show up in the mirror your image doesn't show in their mirror they look at you looking for one thing but when you're traveling with the blessings of God they don't see you as you really are they didn't see Isaac so they put him out and what they didn't know is that the man was blessed they put him out and he had to take all of his herdmen and all of his family and all of his followers and they went to a place and said well you know mm, the body is so much percent water and we can't live without water we're going to have to feed our cattle and we're going to have to wash our clothes we've got to have water I remember there was a well over here that uh, my daddy used so, so dig over there and, and you'll open up one of my daddy's wells they dug and they dug and the next thing water starts springing up but the same men that put him out they came and said hey 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 you are still too close to to our town this is our water get, get, get away from here and they drove him away but before they drove him away he named it Esek and, and said that means strife uh, the water is good but I don't want to be in a place where I got to fight for a drink of water so he moved on said my, my, my daddy had another well it, it's, a, it's a, down here in the next town so they moved on and, and dug and dug and the next thing that was the water and then here come the men of g -Ra. you can't have that either and he said well that's, that seems to be a bit of uh, enmity here so he named it Sitna and he moved on out so this time I'm just going to move until I get out of the city limits. I'm going to move across the county line. I'm going to move to another state. I'm going to move all the way out here in the country. Out in the wilderness where it seems none productive. I've been trying to trust my daddy's faith. I've been trying to reopen my daddy's blessing. But if there's anything I know about my daddy's God, is that my daddy's God will be my God also. Mm. So he moved on out into a dry place. Tell somebody and tell them if you really want to succeed, you got to even trust God when you're in the dry place. You got to trust God when you're there where people say ain't nothing happening. You got to be willing to trust God when they say the thing you trying to succeed in nobody is succeeding in that anymore but you got to tell them I still hear it down in my spirit God is telling me this is my calling and it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not I'm just gonna trust God for my calling and he said dig over there and the servants wanted to know, do, do you know what you're doing, uh, Isaac? Uh, that, that ain't nothing but wilderness land. But I hear him say, I got a radar from heaven and it said, dig. Uh, I, I, the Lord spoke to me and said, dig. You're digging in rocky ground, but dig. He dug and the next thing, the water began to gush up. He looked and saw the water, tasted the water looked over the hill but what nobody coming looked down the road but what nobody coming he said I see now they didn't believe that this thing would succeed they didn't believe that God would do what he's doing and they've also come to realize that he'll bless whatever I put on my hand he'll bless whatever I touch so he said no more he said no more sitting on no more strife no more enmity Rehoboth which means roomy place for now the Lord has made room for us I wish you'd tell somebody whatever you're trying to succeed in if God put it in your spirit, he'll make room for you. Woo! Listen. 
listen, I'm going to my seat. But this is what you got to understand. He called it roomy place. Because the men of Jira tried to shed him out. He said, but the Lord made room. You ever look like everything you, 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 you tried? That there was always somebody or some force shutting you out. But in spite of all the tricks, in spite of all of the push outs, they tried to push you out the neighborhood. They tried to push you out the job. Family members got angry. They tried to push you out the family. And you ran into some folk at church. And they used the little position they have. Try to push you out in church. But in spite of all the pushing. In spite of all the blockades. You were able to just squeeze in the dough. God made room. But the rest of it was a prophecy. Right now, be contented with the room. But tomorrow, you're going to be fruitful. Oh my God. Tell somebody, you may not be fruitful yet. But has he made room for you to get in the door? You may. you may not be a supervisor you may not be a manager y'all don't hear what I'm saying they may have only let you come in to sweep some floors but if you got in the door if he made room You'll be fruitful. Fruitfulness is coming. You got to be like Joseph down in Egypt. <laughs> Lord, let me, let me hush. Joseph had a whole lot of stuff in his background. Jealous, evil brothers that sold him to some Ishmaelites who sold him to a band of Egyptians <laughs> got a job and the boss's wife lied on him and he ended up in prison but one day he came out of the prison and interpreted the king's dream and when he got through interpreting the king's dream the king took the ring off his own finger and put it on Joseph's and say, I'm making you ruler. Won't nobody in Egypt be over you but me. What does Joseph do? The king gives him a wife, the daughter of the priest of On, named Azanath. She bore him two children. The first one he named Manasseh. Said, now if I'm going to enter into my blessing, I got to forget about my brothers. I got to forget about my father's house. I got to forget about even being put in the prison. In fact, I realized that all of that was good for me. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. If I hadn't been a dreamer, my brothers wouldn't have hated me. If they hadn't hated me, they wouldn't have put me in the pit. If they hadn't put me in a pit, they wouldn't have sold me to the Ishmaelites. If they hadn't sold me to the Ishmaelites, I wouldn't have ended up in Egypt. If I hadn't ended up in Egypt, I wouldn't have got the Potiphar's house. If I hadn't got the Potiphar's house, his wife wouldn't have lied on me. If she hadn't lied on me, I wouldn't have been in prison. If I hadn't gone to prison, I wouldn't have met the butler of Baker. If I hadn't met the butler, the beggar, I never would have met Pharaoh. It's good for me. 
Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. So he named that first boy Manasseh. Say, I got to forget my toil. I got to forget everything the devil did against me. And before you can enter into the blessing, you got to dump this junk that have accumulated in your mind. You got to get rid of your hard feelings and your animosities and hatreds. But when he forgot about everybody that tried to destroy him, he was blessed with another child. Said, I'm going to name him Ephraim because this one says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. But I couldn't be fruitful until first of all I forgave. I couldn't have prosperity until I got rid of hard feelings. I got to go to my seat. But I want you to know if God has made you a promise, if you know what your calling is, if you wait, hey, wait through the hard trials, wait through tribulation, wait through disappointment, criticism, wait, and before you know it, your day of blessing will come. It's been 30 years, 30 years through hard trials, tribulation, persecution, but we remain faithful. And now I can say this is the day that the Lord has made. gonna let you go but you you just don't know what's turning over down in my spirit I serve a God who is faithful when you tell somebody he's faithful he haven't forgot about you he haven't forgot what he promised you faithful You better give him some praise. <laughs> you better give him some praise. You better give him some praise. I mean right now, no, 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 Satata. Right now, you better give him some praise.
Hallelujah. Come on and give him praise in the house. Open your mouth and give him praise. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory. Glory. Well, I had wanted to go directly into the invitation, but since that spirit, that anointing to give is here, hallelujah. If you want to just come on and drop it on the altar, but you don't want to give your life to the Lord, don't you dare leave. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Thank you.